Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand a start to fall And all those lonely roads that I traveled on And there was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground And the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now And there was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus For this man who needs amazing kind of grace For forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay Well, I'm not perfect, so I thank God every day And there was Jesus There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it or couldn't see it There was Jesus on the mountain in the valleys There was Jesus in the shadows of the eyes There was Jesus In the fire In the flood There was Jesus Always is And always was And I will never walk alone You'll always stay
you, Lord God, for the truth that we know. Hallelujah, Lord, that you've taken us out of darkness. Put us into your kingdom of light, Lord. Hallelujah. We come alive in you today, Lord. Let's sing this out. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave.
that comes from you, that comes from the truth of your word, Lord. Hallelujah. We declare it. We confess it today, Lord.
that the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know if you have joy. You know if you have, how do you know? There's a smile. There's a life about you. It radiates from you. It affects everything about you. You can't hide joy. Joy is not mental instability. Joy is not depression. Joy is not anxiety. Joy is laughter, dancing. Joy is from the inside that overtakes you that you can't stand still anymore. That is the joy of the Lord. It says the joy of the Lord is my strength. It doesn't say it's my weakness. It doesn't say it's my hindrance. It says the joy of the Lord is my strength. That is where it comes from. That is what the kingdom of heaven is about. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. And it's about joy. There are the three characteristics. If you want to know what Jesus was like, I just told you what he was like. He was righteous. He had peace and joy flowed from him. This is how the world knows who we are. We're not sad with the world. We don't have mental issues with the world. We don't have depression and anxiety because I don't accept it because it's not part of the kingdom. I only accept what is part of the kingdom and that's joy. You can't hide joy. Joy is part of who you are as a believer. That is part of your inheritance with the saints. So let's praise God just for a second. Father, we praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. We thank you for the joy of the Holy Spirit. For it is how we live our daily lives. Father, we will not do without it. I will not do without it because it is mine. I don't accept anything other than what you have offered me. And I thank you for the joy of the Lord this very day. And we give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. You can go ahead and be seated today. Does the mic sound all right? Sound all right back there? All right. Well, um, this was a little different for me. I was asked not too long ago to speak today. Um, and it seemed good. It didn't seem, there were no red flags on the inside, so I know it was a bit of a surprise for you, Dad. Uh, but it seemed good. And if the Holy Ghost approves, then I approve. It's as simple as that. Um, and so it really, it's, I couldn't think of a bigger honor. There, there's, there's no other honor that I would be more privileged to partake of. Um, Growing up, my dad, <laughs> he, uh, he never wavered one time, not one time, and who he is, he never wavered one single time. And for me, and you can see it in today's age, um, stability is something that is not real common. Stability at the house, um, stability in attitudes, my dad never just just flew off the cuff. He never did that, ever, ever. Even growing up, now I got plenty of whippings growing up. I got a lot. Uh, it says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. They drove it and drove it <laughs> and drove it, right? But the defining characteristic of our household was stability and love. So, Dad, for that, I thank you. Because of the example you set of going out to Rama, when God called me to go to another state, I could do it. It was an easy thing. And in fact, actually, my dad, if anything, kind of pushed me towards it. When I came home, I said, uh, well, I was at school today, and uh, I was supposed to go down to Georgia. And instead of dad never one time wavering, say, are, are you sure? Are you sure about that? And, you know, you, we don't know anybody down there. Uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll work, we'll research around here. Instead, he said, pretty much in a nutshell, I'll help you pack your bags. And from a parent's point of view, that is such a godly example. And who I am today, fully surrendered to God, is because of the example he set. 
My life is not my own. I do not own myself. Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, owns me. And that comes from the example that my parents set for me. So dad, thank you for that. I am eternally grateful for that. Because of that, I have salvation that I'm surrendered to my master. So thank you for that. Today we're going to talk a little bit, obviously it's pastor appreciation. And I was asking the Holy Ghost in preparation. I said, I don't know if I really want to talk exactly about pastor appreciation. I said, Holy Ghost, if you could just give me a real good message, I'll feel like I really made my dad proud, you know, made pastor proud, like just give me a good message. And uh, <laughs> it's not quite how it worked out. Um, earlier this week, it was as if someone had just, uh, I, I know many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's just like all of a sudden your eyes were just flooded with understanding. It's like somebody just pulled something back and I saw more in the realm of honor than ever before. In fact, actually, when I get home uh, back down in Georgia, I have to go to my pastor and I'm going to honor him more than I already have. I'm already going to give him more substance uh, money than what I already have because of what I've seen, what God has shown me. And I really want to share those things today with you. And I will tell you, when the Holy Ghost reveals something to me, he reveals it to me in the word. But I tell people, it's like the biggest game of connect the dots you've ever seen in your life. I can't explain it. The Holy Ghost reveals it in such a fast pace. Many times I have to say, Holy Ghost, you have to slow down. I've missed it. I missed that scripture. What, what, what was that thought you just told me? I need you to, to slow it down. And he'll remind me. But it's like these scriptures just connect. So um, when the Holy Ghost reveals something to me, I hope you have your Bibles with you. It's a lot of scripture. Because that's how I live my life. The Word and the Spirit. The Scripture is my basis for everything. So if you will, turn with me to uh, Proverbs chapter 4. And we're just going to lay groundwork. Um, Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1. So Proverbs, uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Now, when I read that, I take that personal because God is my father. And he has given me his word. So it says, Listen, my son, to a father's instruction. I say, okay, my father is giving me instruction right now. And he just told me to listen. Pay attention. So I'm on high alert when he tells me this. He says, I give you sound learning do not forsake my teaching, for I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me, and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. God is the wellspring of wisdom. That's where all wisdom comes from. So he just told us the key to the beginning, basically of all wisdom, is to determine within yourself, I'm going to get wisdom. I want wisdom. So what does that tell me? That tells me I have to turn to the word of God. That's the very first thing I have to go. If I'm having trouble in my life, the first place I'm going is the Word. Because the Word of God is my general instruction for life. The Holy Spirit will, re will reveal to you specific instructions, but the Word is the basis. It's the general instruction. So I want you to turn to Psalms chapter 119. I think this is probably the most famous psalm of all. 119th psalm. Psalm 119, and we're going to go to verse 129. We're going to read through 132. So I have a little thing. Um, my wife and I were youth pastors at our church, and we always tell the youth, when you get there in the Bible, just say amen, so I know you're there. So uh, is everyone there? It's Psalms 119, verse 129. Amen. All right. I want to make sure we're all there because I don't want anybody to miss this. This is your approach to the Word. Right now, the Word is telling us, 
how we need to approach what the Bible says. If you don't approach it from this perspective, you won't receive anything from it. It's going to have a hard time if you have a bad attitude about what God says. And he says, your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. That in of itself is absolutely amazing. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. How many times have we heard people say about how hard the Christian life is? Or it's so hard for me to just to, to live how I, I, don't, I can't do it. I don't know how, how I, you know, I can't, I can't not drink. You know, I can't, uh, you know, we could go through, I can't lose my temper. I can't go through all these things that God says are, you're not supposed to do. Or how about this? You're not supposed to fear. But so many people, especially nowadays, their life is just destroyed with fear. And they say, oh, I, I can't do that. That's too hard for me. Well, that's because your perspective on the word is incorrect. Because right here, the psalmist, he says, your statutes are wonderful. If you know they're wonderful, they're easy to obey. It's not hard. When you cherish, when you value what the Word of God says, when he says, fear not, you say, okay, well, that's easy. Well, what else am I? I guess I'm just going to start rejoicing because, you know, I'm not afraid of anything. So I'm just going to start being happy, right? Fear not. But that comes from the perspective of your statutes are wonderful. The unfolding of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Now, when I was reading this, it kind of hit me in a different way. I realized the psalmist absolutely loved the word of God. He absolutely loved it. It was a pleasure to him to read it and obey it. It was not something heavy. It was not something that was wearing him down. It was something easy. And he saw the benefit of it. It's funny how he said, turn to me and have mercy on me as you always do to those who love your name. The psalmist knew something about God. He knew that God was merciful. How did he know that? That doesn't come just from someone telling you he's merciful. That comes from you experiencing the mercy of God. But this came with all this wisdom. He already knew that God was merciful, but we want to pay attention to before that, how he already knew that. And that's because he already valued the word of God. He was already already living what the word of God said. So we're going to go to um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And as the Holy Ghost was revealing this to me, the reason I gave you those the scriptures before um, is because if your perspective is wrong in receiving the word, you won't receive the treasure hidden in the word for you. Scripture says it's a king's matter to seek out. That it's a king's privilege to seek out. We are, uh, we are kings of the kingdom. And it is your right to seek out what's hidden in the word. It's hidden for you. The world doesn't have access to the revelation of the word. The only revelation that the world can get is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Once they get that, then their eyes can be opened and they can receive more revelation. But until then, they can't. So it's a king's privilege or it's a king's matter to seek out what's hidden in the word. And so Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 through 21, are you there? Verse 19, it says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and varmints destroy, and where the thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So now all of a sudden we are challenged with something. Um, you know, in Proverbs, if I can word it this way, Proverbs, it does talking about how the ant, even the ant in a bountiful time stores up for the winter. So we're not saying you shouldn't have a savings account. That's not what I'm saying. It's wise, it's smart to save up, you know, for things happening in your life. But Jesus is putting an emphasis here. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I really like this because right now you're challenged with something. And this is going to talk directly about your money. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Brother Hagin would talk about there's really two things that anytime you talk about in a church service, people automatically shut down. Number one, you talk about their money, and number two, you talk about their children. 
As soon as you start talking about those things, they want to shut you down. But if we take the word of God as the psalmist did and said, it's a delight, I pant after, meaning I thirst after your commandments of what they say, it's enjoyable for me because now I'm getting help. When God tells me something, it's not a hindrance. It's actually to propel you forward. Anything he tells you is for you to go forward. It's never backwards. Many people, when they first start learning about the tithe, because tithe is a principle that was established before the first covenant. So when you first start telling people about the tithe, the first thing they think about is subtraction. Or maybe at the most, if you really get around to it, they start thinking addition. But that's not even what God said. He said multiplication. Because he's El Shaddai, the God that's more than enough. So anytime God gives us a command, it is for multiplication. It's never to pull us back. But to the natural man, the word will offend you. If you are thinking only with your natural mind and natural reasoning, it will offend you. And if that's the only way you're thinking, I hope it does offend you. I hope it gives you a wake-up call saying, wow, I might not know everything. Maybe there's some more here. So... um, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love this (laughs) because it says store up treasures in heaven. So right now that takes a shift of everything we do in our life. Our goal is now to begin as a believer to start storing up treasures in heaven instead of storing up treasures here on earth. Because this earth is temporary, but that is eternal. That's where the king of kings is. That's where the Lord of Lords is. That's where I'm going to spend eternity with each and every single one of you if you're born again. So I want to know if that's where I'm I'm going to spend my eternity and I can store up treasures in there. And Jesus actually said, that's what you're supposed to be doing. I want to know how to do it. And so he said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a saying, I've heard it down in Georgia, and man, I love it. It says, show me your checkbook and I'll show you where your heart is. People don't like that. People don't like that. But that is a heart check for you. Saying, okay, am I spending all of my money on me? Am I spending all of my resources, my time on me? Or am I advancing the kingdom? Am I storing up treasures in heaven? Because that's what it's about. Jesus said, don't store up treasures here. Store them up in heaven. God is your provider. And he provides lavishly to all those who obey him and follow his commands. So you don't have to worry about not having enough here if you're helping God and storing up treasures there. Because that's how it works. You give him your all and he gives you his all. And that's, that's the transfer between you and heaven is God, I give you everything I have. And he says, <laughs> they make fun of me every time I say this, but it's just who I am. He says, hot dog, now I can pour out a blessing on you. He says, I've just been waiting for somebody that would take me at my word. He says, hot dog, angels, come on. We got some resources this man needs because he's advancing the kingdom. And all of a sudden, the resources of heaven become available to you in an instant of time. But where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Finances are a a very particular thing to talk about, but they are the most talked about subject in the Word of God. There are over 2,000 scriptures referring to finances in the Word of God. That is more than any one subject alone, more than prophecy, more than love, more than uh, Jesus coming, more than uh, any other specific subject. He talks more about money because money can be used for a tool or it can be used for destruction. So he says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So me and my wife, we've just determined in our hearts, we're storing up treasures in heaven. We give more than we ever have. And it's funny, we have more than we ever had. Continually. And I'm talking about supernatural increase. Things break in our house, and all of a sudden a check for $300 shows up in the mail. And this isn't just one instance. This is nonstop. As soon as things get tight, finances, it's like it explodes. It's our our checking account goes from a couple hundred to a couple thousand in a matter of days. And all of a sudden it's like, man, ooh, God, I love your commands. I love your commands. Where do I need to give next, Lord? Who do I need to go minister to today? What do I need to do? Because I've seen the benefits personally of what it's like to serve the king. 
And if you're not experiencing increase in your life, you need to take a step back and say, okay, where am I missing it? Why is this so hard right now? Because with God, it's easy. Now, there's trials. There are trials. But Scripture says, count it all joy. So joy, as you see, is the number one thing of a Christian that is walking in victory, is joy is the side effect. You can't get rid of it. It's there all the time. You can't get away from it. It's there all the time. So where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, Turn with me to James chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. We want to make sure we're receiving the word as it actually is, as it is the word of God. Because if not, you'll get offended at the person who delivers it to you. If you get offended at me today, that's all right. I'm leaving tomorrow. So (laughs) if if you get offended at me, I'm all right with that. Because if you're getting offended at me, you're getting offended at what God has said. And there is a bigger issue at hand. So your approach to the word has to be God, you are smarter than I am. I think it, was it, uh, was it Jesse Duplantis? I can't remember. It was a well-known minister. He said, one of the biggest things I've learned in life is that God is smarter than I am. I thought, if only we could get that. If we could truly get that. But James chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth, And the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Christians should be extremely active. I'm telling you right now, Christians should be active every day of their life. Every day of the life, a Christian should be acting on the word of God every single day. There is no day off. It says it'll save you. If it says the Word of God will save you, evidently not doing the Word of God will kill you. There, with God, there is no in neutral. You're either advancing with God or you're going back in God. You look at Jesus, from the time His ministry started, He never stopped. From the time His ministry began for three years straight, He went from one place to the next, to the next, to the next, Delivering people, ministering to people, teaching people, healing people. That's all he did. And it says we're supposed to be Christ-like. As a Christian, that is our job. That is what we do. We are busy people. That's, that, that's what advancing the kingdom is around. It says the time is short. There's no time for sitting back and relaxing. There's no time for sitting back and say, oh, well, you know. I just, I'm pretty tired. I think I'm going to go on vacation for about two or three months. And Lord, when I come back, I'll, I'll, I'll really dig into the word then. I'll really start doing what you say. Well, understand for that three months, the devil is going to come in. And he's going to wear down on you and wear down on you and wear down on you. And at the end of that three months, it's going to be harder to get in the word than it has ever been before. It's going to be hard. And you're going to be in a dilemma. Because scripture says it's line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Meaning it builds on itself. That's why it says, he who has, to more will be given. And, (laughs) oh, thank you, Lord. There's a lot coming. I'm going to have to move on. Uh, Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Whew, thank you, Lord. All right, Lord, we'll talk about that. The parable of the talents. How many of you are familiar with the parable of the talents? Okay, the parable of talents uh, it says the master came, which in this case would be Jesus. It said Jesus gave to one five talents, to another two, and to another one. Uh, if you look up in the Greek, uh, talents, it is an actual physical amount or an uh, amount of wealth. So you could translate it into a bag of silver, a bag of gold, gave to one $5 million, gave to one $2 million. But this, in this specific instance, Jesus was talking about something physical. He wasn't talking about spiritual wealth. He wasn't actually talking a lot. When I was younger, I took it as talents, as abilities. I thought, okay, you know, one has five abilities, one has two. But he's actually talking about something physical that's been given to you. 
And he said to the one who he gave five, he turned it into ten. And he said, well done, you've been faithful over little, I'll give you much. To the one who had two, he turned it into five. And he said the same thing, you've been faithful over little, I'm going to give you much. Enter in, into the joy of the Lord. But to the one who did nothing with what he was given, he actually called him wicked and lazy. Now that's interesting. He said, cast him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I thought, wow, God, that's amazing. That took me back. This one has changed my life whenever I saw this. There is demanded increase from God in your life. As a child of God, that is who you are. God is increased. He never stays still. God is always going forward. They say the universe is still expanding to this very day. From the time God gave his initial command of the universe being born, it's still expanding. That's amazing that it's still going forth. So as a Christian, there is no room for sitting back and relaxing. The Word of God, we are active in the Word of God every single day. That means studying. That means meditating. That means ministering to people. That means laying hands on the sick. That means if someone's in need, you meet that need. Whew. Praise you, Lord. That means... When it comes time to honor the pastor, we honor the pastor. And that's not just one time a year. That's all the time. And we'll get into what the Word has to say about that. Where did I have you turn? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us. That's amazing. It says they received the Word of God. They received it. It's interesting, he says, receive, that inclines that you can reject. So if you can receive from God, you can also reject from God. It says, when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Wow. You accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed to work in you who believe. It says it's going to work in you if you accept it. If you believe it, it's going to work in you. It's amazing you even find the Word of God is working. That's amazing. The Word of God is even working in you who already believe. That's amazing. It says, but the condition of it working was that you received the Word of God, not as being from a man, but as from God Himself. So, as I'm up here today, and I give you Scripture, how are you receiving it? Are you accepting it? As pastor comes in week after week after week from a message from God, because that's where it's from. I didn't want to talk about this. I didn't. I wanted to have a nice, easy message. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Jump. It's all good. Right? That's, I, it would have been nice to do that. But that's not what he instructed me. So as pastor comes week after week after week, do you receive it as a man giving it to you? Or as the Apostle Paul said, do you receive it as God himself giving it to you? Because God works through man. You cannot find instances where God does not work through man. We are his workmanship. We are his covenant partner. God is in covenant with me, and he is dependent upon me to work just as I'm dependent upon him. No instance can you find where God just goes and does something on his own. He always calls a man or a woman. He always calls a people, a body of believers. Have a church in Fulton County that I'm going to call together every week for divine instruction. Are you going to receive it? Are you going to accept it? Or are you going to reject it? It's amazing God chose a man to deliver his word, which is how he has always done, but it's up to you on how you receive it. So you can see from quite a few scriptures, how you receive the word determines what you get from the word. Um, I would like to go to, it's in the same 1 Thessalonians, but chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. So this is the Apostle Paul. He was just telling them, congratulating them on how they receive the Word of God. They receive it so well. He was saying, you receive it appropriately, so it's going to work in you. And it's funny, in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, it says, How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? Because of how they accepted the Word, the Apostle Paul couldn't even put into words how thankful and how much joy they brought to him. 
He says, this is really cool. He says, night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now, the Holy Ghost was showing this to me. He says, may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. God chose a man, the Apostle Paul in this instance, because they received the word appropriately through the man. He was going to give them what they were lacking. He wasn't going to give it to the person individually. Jeannie, I'm not, I'm not saying this is you, but say Jeannie is lacking in a certain area of faith. I, I just like you, Jeannie. So say she's lacking in a certain area of faith, a certain principle. Uh, maybe she's not being obedient in a certain thing. She's either doesn't have the knowledge or maybe just being stubborn. I know Jeannie wouldn't be stubborn, but right? Say she's lacking in that area. But instead of God talking to her directly, God will talk to the pastor to give her what she needs. There are certain things that God will not share with you directly. You're going to have to get them from the man of God in your life or the woman of God in your life. You're going to have to get them from your pastor because we are a body. Scripture says that Jesus Christ himself have given some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints. That would apply in what is lacking in your faith. If something is lacking, you're not perfect yet or you're not mature yet. But he's not going to give it to you. He's going to give it to your pastor. Otherwise, there would be no need for you to go to your pastor. There's a reason God has put a pastor in your life. And there's some things that you will not get on your own from God. You will get from supernatural relationships that God has hooked you up with. And the number one source in your life that that's going to flow most of the time is your pastor. He's your spiritual lead. God will show him. I know many of you, I'm sure dad has shared, he has dreams like no one I've ever seen before. Maybe he hasn't shared that with you. Maybe I wasn't supposed to share that. I don't know. I'm sorry if I wasn't (laughs) supposed to. Dad has dreams like no one I've ever seen. Like a lot concerning instruction, things that are going on in the world, things that are going on in the church, things that people are dealing with, uh, showing him things to come. And sure enough, they happen. He's got a great tracker, track record with that happening. But God will not give you everything you need directly to you. Some things will come from your pastor, and that will come from how you receive the word. Evidently, uh, they were lacking in a certain area of faith. And the Apostle Paul said, God gave me something for you. Because of how you receive the word, God gave me something for you directly. Uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 12. Actually, I want to do this. I want to go to Romans chapter 1 before we go there. Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. Say amen when you're there, if you would, please. I hope this is helping you all this morning because it sure has helped me. Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. It says, For I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you, now this is amazing, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Now that's amazing. That gives us more insight into what the ministers in our life primarily your pastor, his responsibility is towards you. First of all, the Apostle Paul said he was coming to the people uh, to give them something they were lacking in their faith. And now he said, I'm coming to give you a spiritual gift to make you strong. I like the uh, scripture that talks about, is it Ephesians 6? It talks about the armor of God in Ephesians 6. And it says, after you've done all to stand, after you've done all to stand. It's talking about the armor of God, but it's also talking about all the word of God. After you've done all to stand. What does that mean? Primarily that means being underneath, submitting to your pastor and letting him give things to you that will make you strong. That's what the apostle Paul said. He said, I'm coming to give you a spiritual gift that will make you strong. 
What does strength do? Strength helps you stand in adversity. After you've done all to stand. So you have to receive the word of God from your pastor appropriately. And you have to honor that relationship. And I'm just going to go ahead and read these so we can keep it moving. Um, it says 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 through 12. It says, Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Does the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about the oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in hope of sharing in the harvest. The Apostle Paul said something here. He said, if we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? He was dealing with the Corinthians. He was sowing spiritual seed, but they were not sharing with him material seed. And the Apostle Paul located that as a problem. He said, I'm sowing in you. I am plowing and harvesting spiritual seed into your life. And he said, it's right that I should receive material things in exchange for the spiritual thing. That's what the Apostle Paul just said. Now, like I said, when we start talking about money, people get offended. Right? Because, hey, that's my money. I work hard, right? Well, if God's your source, then it's not your money. And that's, sometimes that can be a tough one. I work 40 plus hours a week. I understand. Trust me, I understand. I go to work. I work hard. Try to anyways. Some days energy might be a little bit down. So I'm like, thank you Lord for strength today, right? But I understand. But he says that those who sow spiritually in your life, it's right to give physically. So that's why I said I already gave to my pastor back home. But after receiving this, I'm going to up my honor. Because my pastor has probably saved my life many times. Growing up, my dad was my pastor. And unfortunately, looking back, I should have done more to honor him. But now I'm older. I see light. I've been given the word. You've been given the word today. It is right to give materially to him in exchange for the spiritual gifts. I want to just show, um, kind of jumping all over. I'm trying not to be too awfully long. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 58. And we're going to be towards the end here. I know you all have been sitting very long. But Matthew chapter 13, verses 53 through 58. And so the Apostle Paul, what he was saying to the people is because they received the word appropriately, he was able to move supernaturally. The word that God had gave him, he was able to supply what they were lacking he was able to give them a spiritual gift. But Matthew chapter 13, verses 53, it says, When Jesus had finished these parables and moved on from there, coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. It says he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. It's amazing. It says a, prop, or a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he associated a lack of honor with a lack of faith. Now that's amazing. A lack of honor, Jesus said, is actually a lack of faith. Whenever you give of yourself to your pastor, which is appropriate, I know what he's done for many of you. I know what he's done for me. When you give, you honor that gift and you then qualify for him to receive from God for you. Spiritual gifts. Some of you have spiritual gifts that you still haven't received. And it may just because honor has not been to the fullest measure it should be. Honor will open up doors spiritually for you 
that will come no other way. When you honor the word and you, when, when you honor where the word comes from, spiritual gifts will start moving. Jesus said he couldn't do any great miracle here. Um, different translations say he healed a m- couple minor ailments. Now to us, we'd be like, man, you see that guy, he came in with the flu and he left without it. Man, praise God. But God said, that's a lack of faith, what they were showing. He said, I wanted to do many things for them. I wanted to do marvels before them. If we want marvels happening in the church, if we want the gifts of the Spirit in operation, it comes from honoring the vessel that's being used. Because that's where it flows from. God always uses someone. And it's for your benefit that you honor where the source is. Because when the vessel is honored, then increase can happen. It can flow through him. And all of a sudden, church services don't seem so dead. All of a sudden, healings start happening. All of a sudden, revelation starts opening up to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. When honor happens, especially to the man of God, miracles will flow. Prophecy will be given in help of instruction for you. It's going to happen. But if honor is not there, it will be shut up. There's a flow to the Spirit of God. There is a flow. And the Holy Ghost gave me this. I won't call it a vision. You just kind of see it uh, with, your, with your heart, I guess you could say. But he almost showed me like this, uh, this little well, and there was a stream of water flowing from it. And for every time someone took offense to the word, offense means not accepting the word. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. It's as simple as that. So I saw this stream flowing from the well, and every time someone took offense at the word, it was like someone threw a stone where the water was flowing out. And at first, the water still came out. Like 10, 15 years ago, man, our church services were really powerful. Man, it was just flowing. But over time, people took offense to the word, and they they slowly threw these stones in front of where the water was coming out. And then the water... It kind of came troubled out. It had a little more resistance coming out, but it still came out. Things were still flowing, but it was a little rocky. And then as the the more rocks got thrown, all of a sudden the only thing seeping through was this little trickle of water coming through the rocks. And it seemed like the flow had stopped even though the water was still there. There was a flow that is supposed to happen in Freedom Worship Center. There was a flow. Thank you, Gene. There was a flow that is supposed to happen here, and it's supernatural. It is absolutely supernatural. You will have miracles happen in this building. You will have people that come in that are sick and lame and are full of the devil and are demonic, uh, demonically oppressed, uh, demonically possessed. And if the flow is stopped up, There will be strife and contention in the house rather than the devil being driven out of the house. And so where honor is, it lets the flow continue. (laughs) Where honor is, it lets the flow continue to go. So if there's no honor, there's no flow. But God's will, I believe, for this house, not that I'm prophesying, but I know how good my father is. His will is for people to come into the church and have needs met. People that are sick. People, even people that maybe have COVID and they're about to go on a resp- or well, not a respirator, what's it called? Ventilator, right? Instead of going on that, they can come into the house of the Lord and because there's such a flow, they come in and the healing power of God just touches them as soon as they come in. It's as simple as that, but you have to let the spirit flow. The number one way you're going to see pastor, when honor is given to pastor, the flow is going to increase. The second thing that has to happen is you have to learn how to receive that flow. Honor will increase the flow, and then you and yourself have to learn how to accept the flow. It is Jesus' will. When the man came to him with leprosy, he said, Lord, I know you can make me clean if thy will. And when Jesus answered that man, he answered for every person for all eternity that ever had an ailment in their body. He said, it is my will, be thou clean. That is what he said. It is God's will for you to be without any trouble in your body. Was it Aaron? 
that was 80 some years old, and he said he was stronger then than what he was when he was in his 40s. It went into the promised land. Caleb, it was Caleb. It was Caleb. He was 80 something, and he said, I'm stronger than I was when I was in my 40s. What is that? That's flowing with God. You say, Oh, I'm getting older. My body has to start going down. No, it doesn't. For the world, it does. For the world, they have no hope. But for the child of God, life gets better and better yeah. and better. Moses right. said his eyes weren't even dimmed at an old age, meaning he could see clearer than ever. Now, Moses was the man who went up on the mount and spent days with God. That is, God has not changed. That is what he still wants for today. But we're talking about pastor appreciation, and it comes through honor. Honor will open the door for that, and your church services will change. Maybe your church services have been great. Maybe they've been a little dull. I know universally across the United States since COVID, numbers have dropped. But that's because we've stopped the flow. We got into fear. We stopped accepting the word. Jesus said, come to me all who are lame and sick and weary. The sick should be able to come into the church. We shouldn't be worried about somebody with COVID coming to church. Praise God you're here. You're getting delivered today. People didn't come to Jesus. <laughs> it said they thronged about him. That they may get close to him. They might touch him. It says the woman who came in faith, she said, if I may just touch the hem of his garment. And she was healed like that. Sick people came to Jesus all the time. But if there's no healing flow, they're not going to come. And instead, what do we do? Oh, I, I don't know. They say, say there's another variant coming around. Maybe we should, maybe we should close the doors for a couple weeks. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we, we, just, we need to be smart about this. We, you know, we, we need to be smart. We just need to close the doors on the church for a year, and then when it's all passed over, you will never open your doors again. Because the devil is not playing. So God's will for this church is increase. Right. And the, the, the step we're talking about today, I mean, there's so many steps you could talk about, but the step for today is honor. Honor where the word comes from. And your church services will change. I receive, you, two of you can be sitting beside one another right now, and one of you can be receiving, and one of you can be about half falling asleep. In fact, actually, I see it in some people's eyes. Other people are like, this is good. And the next person beside them, ooh, whoo, wake up, wake up. Right? That's how you receive the word. That's how you receive the word.